The following video was brought to you by Audible, where you can start a free 30-day trial by visiting audible.com slash bunnyhop. This time, the audiobook I'm recommending is The Martian, narrated by R.C. Bray, who starts off sounding kind of like he's from King of the Hill. But Space Hank Hill is just one character out of a diverse cast of bureaucrats arguing over this guy. Stick with it for a couple hours and it turns into this rousing, nostalgic procedural drama and a conflict between a writer coming up with a whole bunch of problems for a character determined to survive. And hey, it's thematically appropriate too. Doom comes out in like a month and you get stranded on Mars in that too. And this book's probably gonna be better. Once again, that's audible.com slash bunnyhop. So with that being said, let's get on with the show. One of the greatest challenges facing people of the future is going to be how to preserve digital media built for today's machines. We're living in a kind of precarious time where an incredible amount of human knowledge can be found with a quick Google search, but it's always slowly going away and slowly becoming obsolete. Remember that about seven years ago, before GOG showed up to fill a hole in the market, PC game sales from before 1998 and earlier were pretty much non-existent. Sure, GOG found a way to resell them, and sure, you can always emulate them, but both solutions are more trouble than simply opening up an old book and finding ink still being there on paper. It's hard enough to get PC games from 20 years ago working on a computer today, so imagine how much harder that'll be 200 years from now. This is why I care about bots. Even after getting an old game up and running again, it's kind of a wasted effort if it was focused on online multiplayer. Bots give us a snapshot of the past. They let us see how games worked in their heyday. They preserve gaming history by acting out a gameplay demo no matter the time or place. And if you were playing a lot of FPS games from the late 90s to early 2000s, they were a feature that seemed almost ubiquitous. Even though as history would have it, they were more of a trend. In an ironic turn of events, the games of today won't really be needing bots until it's too late, far past the game's window of profitability. When people 20 years in the future want to see what a round of Rainbow Six Siege looks like, I guess they'll have to watch videos. And figuring out why this is the case is a quest started by looking at what may be the very first bot ever, the Reaper bot for Quake 1. Steve Polge coded up a Cavalier AI scripting method that has these bots following a breadcrumb trail left by the player's own movement to use for their pathfinding. The same routes you use determine the rail that this aimbot turret jumps along, which means it'll race for power-ups and weapon drops for map control just as you do, which is more than enough for a rudimentary practice session, or in our case, a historical snapshot for how Quake used to play in our far-off future of 2016. Although, you won't see them do any fancy rocket jumping or bunny hopping until you pull off those moves yourself. And once you grab the hidden weapon or the quad damage, the bots suddenly don't seem to know what to do. Those are uncommon enough moments that, in my brief 15 minute session, they didn't have time to learn to adapt to them which only meant that it was time for me to screw with them further. After loading up a new server and not moving an inch, I spawned in a bot and immediately snuck up on it invisibly with observer mode. At which point it just fell in a puddle, got stuck in a corner, and aimlessly swam around in circles until I woke it up. And of course, within seconds, it was one-shotting me with rockets from across the map. Sure, it may stumble as it learns as it goes, but even an AI from 1996 learns the game ridiculously faster than us pitiful humans. And for the most part, this is the same basic course of action that the bots of the next few games would take. Make a quick basic map in Quake 3 or Unreal Tournament and load in a lone bot. Despite the two games' different methods for AI programming, you'll see mostly the same results. They'll be nearly perfectly still until line of sight with the player is met. At that moment, they'll immediately spring into action, dashing left and right in what we think are unpredictable patterns, while hitting perfectly tuned shots at the player because, well, they're technically using an aimbot. But unlike the Reaper bots from Quake 1, one, you'll notice that these supposedly more advanced AIs don't feel around the walls to learn their pathfinding. After Quake 1, Steve Polge got hired by Epic Games to work on their rival to Quake, Unreal. Unreal featured the first commercially developed multiplayer bots, which was a huge selling point a year after Quake 2 released with no bots in sight. But this time, with professional standards on the line, the bots had to work well from the start. No learning process here. Pre-placed waypoints planted by the dev were now the bot's main mode of transportation, rather than the ones laid down by the player. So individual points of action now had to be laid out. All those full-time employment hours had developers hand-placing tens if not hundreds of waypoints that distanced a bot's jumps, toggled their tactics, switched their logic, and even instructed them on where to wait for elevators in addition to trying to account for every conceivable route the bots could take through a level. 
Meanwhile, Quake 3's solution tried to streamline development a bit, strategically placing armor shards and roping off invisible boundaries rather than routing bots into preferred routes count as Quake 3's bot waypoints. An intelligent pathfinding system keeps them moving throughout the map by way of item pickups. They try to reach item pickups, meaning that for Instagib maps, mappers actually had to script up player invisible item pickups to optimize their level for bot play. So in effect, they're only appearing to hunt down the player since you're both chasing after the same stuff. But of course, you'd never see that mentioned on the back of the box. In 1999, this race to create the most convincing bots had Quake 3 and Unreal Tournament entirely ditching the corridor campaigns of earlier for single-player modes that were entirely bot matches, which is a feature that spread into all sorts of unexpected places. The Nintendo 64 had an analog stick, and thus was home to a gold standard of customizable bot matches in perfect dark. Which again, are hardly perfect. Notice how they're locking onto the other team through the ceiling. Sure, it's slow and rougher than what you saw at PCs at the time, but Perfect Dark may still retain the benchmark for out-of-the-box features. You could fill a map with eight customizable simulants with variables not just for their difficulty, but also their rules, their personality, and their individual sets of clothing. The team behind that game branched off to form Free Radical and do the Time Splitter series, keeping the ethos of PC Arena first-person shooting alive on consoles. You had three games, each one a wacky blender of anachronism shooting each other in single-player challenge modes of multiplayer bot matches. This period, from 1999 to 2004, is when bots were at their most ubiquitous. For pretty much any game with a significant multiplayer component, there was a two out of three chance that it would come served with bots. Jedi Knight, James Bond, Red Faction, Renegade, even Conker's Bad Fur Day had bots, and of course so did Battlefield. In fact, Battlefield may have been the boldest and the most necessary franchise where bots were needed. Otherwise, you'd need anywhere between 16 and 64 players to get an accurate snapshot of how these games were meant to be played, and the further in history you go, the less likely that is to happen. Battlefield maps are way bigger than the arena shooters mentioned previously, and you have players regularly switching between FPS and vehicular modes of gameplay, which means more different types of AI have to be made to play effectively over greater distances, which means more programming, more bug testing, and more waypoint placement. It couldn't have been easy, but they did it. They had bot support for all their games across 1942, Vietnam, Battlefield 2, 2142, and then that kind of just stops at Bad Company 1, and they don't come back from that point onwards, only briefly appearing in a co-op mode of Bad Company 2 DLC. Meanwhile, Halo was proving all along that you could push out a big multiplayer shooter without bots and still push millions of sales just fine. And this, from 2005 onwards, is when bots were, and have remained, relatively dismissed. Nowadays, pretty much any game with a big multiplayer component is not likely to have a true bot match mode. You got whatever the hot variant of horde mode is, but that's not the same thing. The AI follows different rules than human players. It's not a snapshot of how the game was meant to be played. And neither are the Battlefield campaigns. I really enjoy and love the Battlefield Bad Company 2 uh, game. Um, I just love that type of theme and that type of humor within the game. And recently, I kickstarted it up, uh, loaded it up, and actually went into a game, and there was two or three players. And that's not the way it's meant to be played. Yeah, I know, and I'm like, where is everybody? I can't, how can I take this um, flag when there's no one against me? As a kickback as well, too, um, just basically before doing this interview, I, I loaded up Operation Flashpoint. I loaded up a mission game and I sh threw down a couple of squads and a couple of tanks and did the same on my side and had this grand old time and it just like took me back to almost 1990, um, 2000. Um, I was just like, shit, I'm just back in my t teenage years again playing in the same um, map, playing against the same AI and it felt authentic. That was Chad Lyon, a former AI programmer for Bohemia Interactive who worked on their virtual battlefield simulation technology during the Arma 2 and 3 days. 
Hello guys, um, I'm actually Chad Lyon from, I used to work at Behind Me Interactive Studios, uh, the department that was actually building and making for, uh, virtual battlefield simulations, uh, VBS1, VBS2, and then I previously have left the company um, in the past four years and gone on to more web-based solutions and database systems now. What would you say is uh, your reason for why this feature of AI bots in multiplayer FPS games has been missing in a lot of games? I uh, just being an opinion-based um, actual reaction to it is that it would be mainly um, the market dynamics and actually what customers are actually wanting from the actual product. What is uh, particular about programming the AI in multiplayer modes for Bohemia Interactive style games? We just want to actually go back in time a little bit in regards to the actual typical map size that Behind the Interactive Studios has to actually solve with this artificial intelligence. It's like for a game like um, Quake Free Arena, the default actual map size is around about 316 square feet. So your solutions for your AI for that type of map size will actually be vastly different than, for example, for a game such as Operation Flashpoint that is kind of like an order of magnitude larger than it. What, what does this map size have to do with the quality of the AI running around it? The main issue is really um, the uh, solutions that either programmer actually approach either map size. For example, in Quake 3, they typically use a um, predefined paths within the map and bounding boxes to direct the AI. They will typically have a layered architecture approach for the actual AI so that there will be actually four layers of actually algorithms that the AI um, approaches most of the problems that it has. One would be, one layer would be dedicated directly to uh, pathfinding. The next layer would be actually um, dedicated to intelligence. The third layer will basically be game logic, such as if there is a player there and he's 20% health, do we really want to engage him or do we want to let him go depending on the difficult layer? Now, with Operation Flashpoint Engine or Armed Assault Engine, you're basically needing the AI to navigate over 100 square uh, kilometers of land or 7 square miles of land. Do you guys place the same kind of predefined paths that you would see in a smaller arena shooter for, for BI games? The only predefined paths that actually exist within the game world would be the road network system. The road network system pre-computes all the road networks into a giant graph that when the AI is actually running around the map, um, they'll actually use the road network. It will be actually a more attractive transportation means um, on the map. So the roads in Arma aren't just cosmetic. The AI actually uses them? Yep, uh, the AI will actually use them, the aircraft uh, uses them, and actually all type of game entities within the game world actually uses the road networks in one form or another. There were situations such as um, where different types of vehicles such as aircraft, the aircraft would actually favor the road over desert or land tiles, it will basically be flying there and unfortunately it's um, AI algorithm that it's using because it's so generic will say, hey, there's a road down there. You know what? Let go and fly over it. Even though the Arma games and Operation Flashpoints have this uh, overwhelming amount of problems for their AIs to tackle, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of problems slip through to the final products, but they still maintain huge communities of online players who run PvE type missions together and I'm just uh, wondering why you think there's not as many other franchises or developers capitalizing on uh, on, on that kind of PvE bot match situations. I, I would actually say um, different AI are uh, just generally called for with different type of games that you have with an Operation Flashpoint because the community is actually so much into the basically theme of the products such as um, combat uh, military uh, tacticians and basically the overview uh, command structure and also training within the actual military field they really love getting in there and actually tinkering with the actual um, attributes of the game engine such as giving a player a sniper rifle 
or a 50 caliber sniper rifle, different modifications of tanks, aircraft. They're just using the AI just simply as this um, dummy object that it, as long as it has some basic intelligence, they're very happy with it. Mainstream customers are evidently satisfied with the dummy objects of Arma and the rudimentary challenge posed by the bots of today, which mainly still exist within the Call of Duty, Gears of War, and Unreal Tournament franchises. Bots are by no means extinct, but they are kind of a luxury feature now, and the mainstream acceptance of that situation means that they simply aren't much of a concern today as they used to be. Try as I might, I could not find a whole lot of angry editorials or nostalgic developer post-mortems about the good old days of bots and how popular they used to be. The conspiratorial answer would speculate about marketers pushing to end piracy and tether customers to online services, but between all three of the developers I questioned, they all put the blame at much less sinister factors. Instead, it was mostly customers having greater access to the internet that was naturally decreasing demand for a costly feature meant to substitute for the internet. Steve Polge, still working at Epic Games, still making sure the new UT has bots just as good as they always were, said having good bot AI was really important 15 years ago, when most people didn't have good internet connections, and many players weren't familiar with or comfortable with online multiplayer. It's also gotten harder as the skill level of FPS players has climbed over the years. It's hard to get bots to the point where they are a satisfactory and interesting challenge in a multiplayer game. And he still prioritizes, after all these years, the importance of a good bot match. Quote, we still think having good bot AI is very important. It's a great way to introduce new players to a game or provide practice opportunities for experienced players, and supports great co-op experience and experiencing larger scale battles with just a couple friends. We're really happy with how the bot AI in the new Unreal Tournament is progressing, and we have a lot of plans to continue to improve it. For their credit, about every major Epic Games release in their library, for the genres where this is applicable to at least, had bot match modes. Except for Gears of War 1, which Steve Pohl simply said, says, we didn't have time for it. Which does imply that good bots take a lot of time to make. Steve Ellis, who didn't directly work on the bots of Perfect Dark and Time Splitters, but nevertheless served as their project managers, did push for the decision for Time Splitters to have them. He says, I'd say that the main reason that bots are missing is the boring obvious reason. They're very hard to do well, so developers choose to use their efforts elsewhere. I asked about the differences between programming AI for single player versus multiplayer modes, hoping to figure out why multiplayer is so much more demanding. And he said, the vast majority of NPCs that you encounter in games are heavily scripted and intended only to cope with a very narrow set of circumstances that are largely in control of the developer. They really don't understand what's happening. They're just taking pre-scripted actions in response to predetermined triggers. That makes implementation much less daunting. Bots, on the other hand, need to be able to play the game as closely as possible to how any other players would play, so they need to be able to use all of the abilities that are available to real players. They need to understand and react appropriately to any situation that might arise. That requires a lot more work, and even in the best case, it's going to be reasonably easy to tell which players are real and which aren't. And that makes sense. Multiplayer games are non-linear and unpredictable. They're meant to have a vast possibility space of outcomes by design. It's naturally going to be a more complicated process making a bot who can keep a game interesting over hundreds of matches in the same level versus a bot who's just meant to walk into your gunfire and die. One's meant to do its job just once and get it over with, and the other's meant to create lasting value, which means higher costs. I don't think it's a coincidence that the lack of bots in Battlefield games started to happening around the same time the games featured this cutting-edge destruction system, which would have put a far heavier burden on polishing their pathfinding and visibility logic. If you had to put yourself in the shoes of back in 2007, before YouTube, before a lot of games had a dependency on social media marketing, and you were putting out Bad Company 1 after previously working on the battlefields, you, you think they just wanted to save money? Um, no, I think it was just basically the expectations and the market at the time. If you go back to the original battlefields, you would actually see that most people were on dial-up internet. Um, lands were very popular. So these games with large land masses, you would typically want to populate the map with a lot of um, bots because your dial-up internet connection didn't really suffice for the re connection requirements for 64 or 128 players. I've mostly been interested in playing with bots for the purposes of, of historical preservation, kind of demoing the game and seeing how it was meant to be played on a platform that maybe it wasn't or a time in which it wasn't. 
And do you think this is a priority for developers when making their game? Do they want to see what an online FPS is going to play like when maybe it's 40 years later and, and everyone's forgotten about it? I would actually just simply quote that it's more of a return of the investment. Um, the long-term return of investment for uh, game development studios, they're basically looking at the short term. They're looking at basically ha um, what are the social trends, what are the players really expecting or our customers actually expecting from the product and how can we quickly and efficiently deliver that product to them. Their goal of um, the game actually existing in 10 or 20 years doesn't really mean much to them. So here's my conclusion. The strenuous labor of placing pathfinding nodes versus the unreliable results of unscripted pathfinding, plus the high cost of programmers and the high demands of now skilled multiplayer gamers, means that programming bots is simply hard ass work. Meanwhile, it's the future. Our always on broadband internet connections and the higher pools of real human players that can jump into any little cheap Steam release, plus the short term irrelevance of historical preservation via bots, means that programming bots is no longer financially worth the cost. It used to be, but now it's not. And that's why bots have gone away, for the most part. You can still find them in UT and COD, but maybe the biggest shame here is that they're so exclusive to older franchises with the bigger, older studios. There's a lot of small multiplayer releases that could use this feature, and then, hell, there's a lot of big multiplayer releases that could use this feature. And if the beautiful intricacies of a good siege match are destined to be forgotten with time, then the future will be at least a little disappointing in some respects. One minute. 